So Nina Wolf, um, in 2007, she took on the monumental project which shaped the book that she will be discussing with us this evening. And uh, so in the project, she translated 700 letters from French to English. And the archive then became a galvanizing experience for Miss Feld and her family. In retelling her father's remarkable journey, his story takes on even larger, more dramatic significance on a world stage. Her own life too comes into sharp to focus, into sharper focus, forgive me, and changes in unexpected, even astonishing ways as the project takes her up and down the east coast of the United States. And she spoke to groups of all ages and ethnic backgrounds about the importance of keeping history alive and the new lexicon of hate and current surge in anti-Semitism. So this evening, Ms. Feld will be speaking about her book, Someday You Will Understand My Father's Private World War II. Ms. Feld's book was recently mentioned on the show, What History Forgot. So let's look forward to a very stimulating conversation Welcome on behalf of Iska. Thank you. December 25th, 1945. My dears, if you have a good memory, you will recognize this stationery. I once received it as a birthday present seven or eight years ago. It so amused me to find it that I kept it to bring with me. From the moment at which my father and his family slammed the door on their lives to narrowly escape Brussels four days before Hitler's bombs exploded on their adopted city, until the moment when he finally arrived back to his building on Christmas Day, five and a half years later, everything worked in staggering synchronicity to bring him full circle. His return from exile so soon after the end of the war allowed him a sense of closure, the sort of closure which lay forever beyond the reach of most victims and surviving refugees of the Holocaust. It's truly an honor and a privilege to speak to you today about one refugee's odyssey and a family who beat the odds. The lessons of the past reflected in his story should serve as a guide to the future. The ultimate goal is, in effect, to unite human beings from all religions and backgrounds so that the atrocities of the Holocaust may be revisited within the context of current events, ensuring that the most fundamental human rights remain at the highest level of our consciousness at all times. We may speak of the shooting of young Malala in Pakistan, who is standing up for the right of all young women everywhere to be educated, or the ongoing atrocities committed by Bashar al-Assad in Syria, to the conflicts and uprisings in the greater Middle East, in Iraq, and against the Yazidis, to Rwanda, to Darfur, and elsewhere in Africa, reaching as far as North Korea. The reality is that the lessons of the Shoah and the stories of those who lived through it should resonate as deeply today is tomorrow and forever. We must be the gatekeepers of these memories while continuing to fight to protect humanity and ensure that war crimes and genocide become a thing of the past so that the future may bring an end to political and religious tyranny. The question for my father was never whether he would fight during the war, but how he would fight his enemy to defeat him. His war, during which he used every ounce of his intellect, was a war of intelligence requiring him more often than not to suppress his Jewish identity. This gave him the freedom to act on a moment's notice while hiding in plain sight. Unlike the average American soldier, he and the young Jewish refugee soldiers like him, who became known as the Ritchie Boys, had a head start in understanding their enemy. They were European refugees who had fled the Nazis. In certain cases, these once stateless refugees had lost loved ones to Hitler's war against the Jews and returned as intelligence officers to vet and send war criminals to prosecution. These boys grew into seasoned men who compensated for their lack of brawn with their intelligence and life experience. In my father's case, he always felt that the army was a period of calm and safety by comparison to his 16-month escape out of Nazi-occupied Europe, while he and his family managed to dodge bombs and bullets before arriving to New York in September of 1941, just three months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, the Spanish freighter on which they arrived, the Navamar, one of the last refugee ships to leave Europe, was bombed and sunk by the Germans on its, on its return 
across the Atlantic. Theirs was a truly miraculous voyage out of a somewhat benevolent Spain, ruled by Franco, a somewhat benevolent dictator with regard to the Jews. Someday you will understand my father's private World War II brings us front and center on a unique story of survival and closure. My father's psychological coping mechanisms were without a doubt exceptional, and they were what allowed him to find normal within the boundaries of his circumstances. He was able to compartmentalize his anguish, work around the unbearable, and as a result, make a personal contribution outside of his military duties. He knew that it could have very easily been him that perished or walked from the gates of hell at liberation. And as a result, he felt a special connection to the displaced people. As my father saw for himself the consequences of that war and of the genocide, he became an ardent advocate for the surviving remnant of the Holocaust. He encouraged displaced people, refugees, and survivors by the tens of thousands as he made his way, he, I'm sorry, he encountered refugees and survivors by the tens of thousands as he made his way north uh, through Italy. One of his first assignments upon arriving to Caserta, just north of Naples, was to translate part of the German army in Italy's order of surrender, as well as to vet war criminals from the masses at POW camps in Getty and Verona before making his way to Austria and Germany. All along his war path, he was simultaneously confronted with the disastrous results of Nazism and rescuing refugees and displaced people. My father decided to take things into his own hands when he appealed first to his best friend's mother and then directly to Eleanor Roosevelt to improve conditions at the former concentration camps turned into refugee camps. And then, when he was posted in Vienna, he encountered the man who had become the greatest Nazi hunter of all time, the president of the executive committee for the Jews in that area, Simon Wiesenthal, whose office was coincidentally located just a few buildings down from his. Then, just a survivor on a mission, my father consulted Wiesenthal about the refugees, the conditions at the camp, and what he could do to help. It was sometimes easy to forget that before the war, the survivors came from all walks of life. They weren't stateless, they weren't destitute, and as a result, they were not on the, and they were on the, not on the verge of starvation and of death. And as we see now, we see this on, on a daily basis on television when we look at the refugees as they come through Greece. And if you juxtapose that, and if you just juxtapose the images from the 1940s to now, and you made them both black and white or both color, I doubt we would see a difference. My father turned the army mail system on its ear to procure as many care packages as he could. And as the winter of 1945 approached, an already unbearable situation was made worse by the oncoming privation of food, cold weather, and illness. His personal war effort raised well over 1,600 packages, which he personally delivered when he organized a Hanukkah party in Gmunden, Germany, during that first November after the war. And although he bitterly complained that he really didn't feel like going and was very, very adolescent about something that he organized, not only did he remember it for the rest of his life, but it would prove an enduring memory for generations to come, as at least one of the men who attended the party a survivor named Jakob Artmann kept a photograph of my father in his special box for the rest of his life. After his death, his daughter would find it in a special box just hidden amongst his personal things, and she eventually tracked down my father in New York and called him to thank him. And I'm very excited to say that on May 14th, on Jacob's birthday, my son, I will meet this woman, and it's a remarkable thing. To, to have looked at a photograph at 70 years old and to meet one of the children of the survivors in this photograph. Today's breaking news concerning the refugee crisis seems to have popped randomly up on our timeline. But if we look back and beyond the headlines, we can see that this second biggest wave of migration in human history, this genocidal war against the Syrian people, the uptick in global terrorism, 
caused mainly by the religious extremism of Daesh and other prominent groups, such as Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab, that we are now faced with the danger of porous borders and the birth of homegrown extremism here in the United States, which challenges not only our values, but the very notion of our civil liberties. Islamic converts to extremism do not pose a very serious, do not only pose a very serious threat to the EU, where the freedom to come and go within the Schengen area of the 26 participating European countries is at stake, but a very serious threat to our national security, to that of the African states where attacks are becoming the norm rather than the exception, and to the Muslim majority states throughout Central and Southeast Asia. History, therefore, is an eternal cycle and is not at all random. In my opinion, the ultimate goal of the jihadi extremists is to indiscriminately attack all people all over the world and includes moderate Muslims, Catholics, Jews, and any other religious group in their path. This relates, therefore, directly to Lemkin's definition of genocide, the roots of which are the words genos, Greek for family, tribe, or race, and seed, the Latin word for kill. Are we not all members of the family of man? This is genocide, and I don't care if it's 20 people here, 139 there. If you add that all up, in my personal opinion, this constitutes genocide. Some say that we are in the midst of a third jihad, a third world war, which according to them is a continuation of an ideal dating back to the birth of the Islamic empire in the seventh century, the desire to force the world to live as a global caliphate under Sharia law has its origins in this phenomenon and is being carried out by an army of young people, some of whom are barely out of their adolescence. Once again, we're caught in the vortex of history. Indeed, the fight against terrorism is not against just a bunch of, it's not just a bunch of Daesh barbarians on a killing spree throughout Europe, but because they have spread across the continents, battle fronts have blurred and diplomacy issues dating back to the close of World War II have resulted in a political climate reminiscent of the Cold War, or the proxy war which is unfolding in Syria between Russia and Turkey. In fact, it goes back a century to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, a secret agreement between the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and the French Third Republic to protect against the ascent of the Russian Empire at the close of the Ottoman Empire. The agreement shaped the region by defining the, uh, the Iraqi and Syrian borders. Many believe that these decisions are what led directly to the perennial conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. The Daesh strategy pits nation against nation in an increasingly xenophobic climate and would like to place the 1.6 billion mostly moderate faithful Muslims under their yoke. These Muslims comprise over 22% of the global population and Daesh is trying to radicalize them through the use of their propaganda and by putting as much pressure on these moderate Muslims as possible in hopes that they will blacken a gray zone and further polarize Western nations by putting them further in jeopardy. The reality is that the jihadists are waging an all-out war against innocent people. This brings up the subject of the similarity between Daesh and the Nazis. These two criminal entities share a common objective wipe out the Jews, wipe Israel off the map, and take every civil society hostage by galvanizing the Muslim extremist diaspora. To quote an article in the Washington Post written just days after the Paris attacks, the strategy is explicit. The Islamic State explained after the January attacks on Charlie Hebdo that such attacks compel the Crusaders to actively destroy the gray zone themselves. Muslims in the West will quickly find themselves between one of two choices. They either apostatize or they emigrate to the Islamic State and thereby escape persecution from the Crusader governor, governments and citizens. The group calculates that a small number of attackers can profoundly shift the way that European society views its 44 million Muslim members and as a result the way the European Muslims view themselves. Through this provocation, it seeks to set conditions for an apocalyptic war with the West. So, propaganda and terror campaigns. 
This is where we begin to see a similarity between the Nazis' effort and the recruitment strategy of Daesh and their common conviction of superiority. The difference between the two is the development of technology in the information age and cyberspace. The disbursement of information now works at the speed of light, multiplying across the globe through the internet, through Facebook, through WhatsApp, Twitter, YouTube, and their, which is not only their route, but it's their main forum. Cyberspace and the internet are the newest theater of war, and not only must we learn to move as fast as the terrorists, but we must institute a collaboration between the networks and social media and all areas of law enforcement to strategically wipe out their communication capabilities and their mafioso means of raising the $2 billion a year which they extort to run their campaign of terror. This means that we must hit them on at least two fronts in hopes of keeping the use of force to a minimum. One is to remove their ability to function over the internet, and two, serve their sever their financial capabilities. This will cause human casualties, but it could save masses. Why then must we continue to gather the testimonies of survivors and continue to educate about the Holocaust? Perhaps because history is a cycle. Because if we take, for example, the Yazidis, a 4,000-year-old religion, and among the oldest in Mesopotamia and Iraq, the day before the Paris attacks in November of 2015, the United States Holocaust Museum issued a report stating that the attack by ISIS on the over 500,000 followers living in Iraq is considered a crime of genocide. And just, I think it's the week before last, Kerry uh, announced that, that it, we, the American government saw it as a genocide as well. The Islamic State performed targeted massacres, rape, and the enslavement of the Yazidi women, as well as forcing young men and boys to join the fight for them or they'd be killed. What is the point of continued education on the subject of the Holocaust if success seems absolutely unattainable and war and genocide are cyclical? Propaganda and acts of terrorism. Hitler's ideology and a hatred against people ignited the Holocaust in much the same way that the, this holy war is being directed at the contemporary world. Well, Holocaust education is a form of condemnation. We must draw upon the similarities of these two periods in the history of humanity to educate future generations and to look to the most egregious period in history so that we may find coping mechanisms to fight this and future waves of terror. Most of the time, we're content to leave behind our family's history as we go about our busy and stressful lives in pursuit of a better life. We learn not to dwell on the past, Pieces are left in real or imaginary boxes in attics or closets, or safely buried deep in our subconscious. Occasionally, the capriciousness of faith steps in to remind us of its importance and can lead us down a road of discovery. Memory is tenacious, and clues are left by intention or coincidence for us to discover in our own time. My time came when my father handed me a green metal box filled with 700 letters he had written home to his family while he served in the U.S. Army during and in the early aftermath of the Second World War. I am the gatekeeper of my father's memories, and by telling his story, my hope is that on some level I can make a small contribution against revisionist history. To that end, it requires us not only to read history, but to feel its impact. To feel history, we need to hear the stories of those who experienced it firsthand. I'm commanded to never forget. Each and every survivor's story is vital. It must be told, because for every story, there are Holocaust deniers, such as Iran's former president, Ahmadinejad, a fervent denier who fed his propaganda to the masses under the guise of education. His replacement, Hassan Rouhani, is said to fall on the moderate side of denial. It's a small improvement, but as long as they and others have a voice and the freedom to express themselves, it's imperative that every story become part of the shield against anti-Semitism, and to that end, a shield against genocide, no matter who the intended victims are. Just this morning, I pulled up, somebody had sent me something to listen to, and I wound up 
listening to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, and it was a broadcast from uh, for Hitler's birthday in 1942. I looked down at the comments, and every single one was anti-Semitic. So I pulled up Bernstein conducting uh, Beethoven's Seventh. Not a single anti-Semitic comment. It was something I just hadn't come across before, and I sat there for 20 minutes reporting to Facebook. As the quantity of Holocaust survivors who can tell their stories firsthand diminish daily, the onus is on us, on the children, on their grandchildren, to tell it for them as accurately as possible and work toward ending current crimes against humanity, no matter where they occur or pose a threat to the fate of man. Ours is one more account to put a nail in the coffin of every denier who questions the veracity of the Holocaust. Politics and laws do not seem to prevent crimes against humanity, but perhaps through the lens of survivors and their descendants, we may serve as a lens through which to see history. My father's, lens, my father's letters sent me on a journey through his unspoken past, on an odyssey where the true heroes were those my father encountered on the long road from exile to return, who numbered in the tens of thousands of survivors and the millions who perished. Along the road, I found another hero, my father, if only because he kept his silence and allowed me to have an unburdened childhood, unencumbered by the weight of his past. The letters were primarily written to his mother and family, but they were intended for anyone in their circle who was interested. When my son was eight, I handed him the first stack of translated letters when he ran out of reading material for school. It was a little late in the day to go to Barnes and Noble and I had to make dinner. A few minutes later, I heard him laughing in his room. Naturally, I yelled at him and I said, do your homework. And he yelled back, I am mom. I'm reading what you gave me and I feel like grandpa's in the room with me. Well, Jacob, grandpa will always be in the room with you. Tears welled in my eyes and I ran into his room. I hugged him and promised to translate every last letter for him. I'm a painter, I studied architecture, and the last paper I wrote before this book was in college. But I must tell you that from the moment I began to translate, the words flowed like water. And I think it's because every child knows their parents' voice. And I found mine in his. The letters were written from the perspective of a surviving refugee in exile, if you will, who chronicled his life in the army on an almost daily basis. We text, he wrote, and boy did he write. I mean, it's 700 letters, I figure, is probably well over a thousand pages of translation. He spoke several times of needing to record his thoughts and use his voice as a vehicle. The letters were written on the most amazing stationery, including Nazi letterhead in full color. Ultimately, he wrote what I think is the most incredible of all of the letters, Nazi stationery notwithstanding, on his personally monogrammed stationery given to him on the occasion of his bar mitzvah, which he found upon recovering his family's belongings in Brussels that Christmas day in 1945. I find it tremendously moving because it gives a precise accounting of every item he found and what exactly he was going to do to ensure their safe return to their rightful owners. He had all of their things brought to the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee office located in the building next to the, next to the Grand Synagogue where he was bar mitzvah. And they lived across the street from what is now the EU compound of buildings on Rue de la Loire. And when I was there and I visited, I got off at the Molenbeek station. So it was pretty shocking to see what happened the other week, because that's across the street from what used to be my father and grandparents' home. Coincidence or fate? His journey took him full circle, and I'm certain that he never forgot a thing. One of his last, and certainly the most chilling revelation, came when he said upon hearing an alarm go off over the hospital's loudspeaker, when I hear that sound, all I can think is, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. The letters can at times be misinterpreted as mundane, but to read between the lines is to disambiguate frustration from banality. And it's there, 
It's at the space between the commas. It's at the pause between his words. It, that's where I could reflect upon what was unsaid. Because what my father chose not to convey served to sharpen the larger picture of events unfolding around him. This is what allowed history into focus. And where he gave voice to his experiences during his training and later upon his return to Europe during the early aftermath of the war, my job evolved into giving voice to his, his evasiveness. Because a lot of times he was content to tell us that he was drinking Coca-Cola and eating ice cream. But look where we were five years ago today. So I would inevitably look at the date and that would send me on an, a journey of, of research. Four years after arriving in the United States, my father, Walter Wolf, who was by then fluent in German and French and conversant in Spanish with some knowledge of Italian, returned to Europe as one of the Ritchie Boys, an exclusive branch of the army, which developed into what we now know as the CIA. The once persecuted returned to prosecute, sending many to trial in Nuremberg. He was barely 20 years old. And on his 21st birthday, he traipsed across the eagle's nest. His letters are riveting, they're heartbreaking, they're often very humorous. And he was a charming and resourceful young man, a keen observer of the turmoil and settling of scores that occurred at the end of the war. He returned to the places of his childhood. He ran into old friends. He eventually liberated his ancestral home in Landau from collaborators who brought the, expro the expropriated house after his aunt was taken to Gers, a French, con French concentration camp. Working as an interrogator in Italy, in Austria, in Belgium, in Germany, and France, he walked around at times like a Jewish John Wayne with a yellow Mogan David glued to his gun holster. Mm -hmm. As a Ritchie boy, one of his first tasks upon returning to Europe, as I said, was to read and classify Mussolini's documents and translate one part of the orders of the Allied forces to the Nazis in northern Italy for unconditional surrender. That, of course, means the, some of the documents that weren't thrown into Lake Como. He was a remarkable young man with tremendous courage and a sense of humor to balance his steadfast determination. But he was determined to make his way home, back to Brussels, to see what was left of their old lives. And by the time he returned to Rue de la Loire, he had grown from a gangly teenager into an American intelligence officer with movie star good looks. When he arrived to his building at 155 Rue de la Loire, he immediately recognized the concierge. Are you Monsieur Hubert? He asked. And the man looked at him and said, well, what's it to you? A moment later, his wife came out from behind him, screamed and almost dropped her mop and bucket when she saw him. She knew exactly who he was. And the only thing Monsieur Hubert could manage to say was, I thought you all dead. You never gave me a sign that you were alive. Incredibly, he recovered most of his family's belongings after learning that Monsieur Hubert, a pharmacist named Demur, and an old family friend had gone to great lengths to protect and keep his family's things. One of these people even endured interrogation at the hands of the Gestapo at the infamous headquarters on Avenue Louise in Brussels. And this is why I think this letter is so important. That building has never been a residential building ever again. It's now the International Press Center. F the second they left, four days later, it became Luftwaffe and uh, Army, German Army headquarters. My father was one of the very few Jewish refugees who managed to reclaim a portion of their former lives and finances, giving his family a rare opportunity to regain a sense of financial and emotional stability. Epilogue. After the war, he graduated from Columbia University and opened the renowned furniture store chain called Bon Marché in New York and in Washington, DC. And before I close, if I may, I'd like to read you a short excerpt from my manuscript. Linz, Austria, 30 July, 1945. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, <coughs> enclosed you'll find a rather interesting publication, if I may call it that. Unfortunately, I could only get these fragments, but it amused me so much that I thought it worthwhile to send it to you. At the same time, I'd like to take the liberty to inform you that while Polish, Yugoslav, and Italian refugees are generously taken care of, the remnants of European Jewry 
are pushed around from camp to camp with nobody taking any real interest in them. I was even told about some officers stating that we had come a little bit too early. Had we come a little later, we would have had fewer of these Jews to worry about. This, I trust, is not the general attitude of all concerned, but it does reflect a certain trend. I was also told by some of these poor people in a camp near Munich that they had no contact with any American relief organizations so far. The same appears to be true in the case of the Salzburg camp. I'm telling you all of this in the hope that a reminder from a person of your prestige and standing should prod some of the organization whose moral duty it is to look after these unfortunate people into action. Respectfully yours, Master Sergeant Walter C. Wolf, 32908561, U.S. Army. I found no record of a response to his letter, but Eleanor Roosevelt's undying commitment shows in her speeches before Congress, in her My Day column, syndicated column, and mostly by the work she did with the UNRRA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, for which she took a great part in the drafting of the Declaration of Human Rights. She wrote, there is in Europe at the present time a group of 100,000 displaced persons the miserable, the tortured, terrorized Jews who have seen members of their family murdered and their homes ruined and who are stateless people since they hate the Germans and no longer wish to live in the countries where they have been despoiled of all that makes life worth living. Is that very different than what's going on? I don't think so. I think there are 60 million displaced people wandering the globe and sometimes I think we pay more attention to an animal that's going to be extinct rather than 60 million souls walking the face of this globe. My grandmother Omi was highly critical of the letter to the former first lady and found the letter to be naive. My father wrote back to her that he wasn't asking for her opinion. Typical. He had chosen to send the letter home first in order to avoid the still prying eyes of the censors, the idea being that his family would then forward it to Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, Omi failed to understand that my father, along with every other Jewish soldier and the 30 or so Jewish chaplains in Germany and Austria directly after the war who took part in both the liberation of the camps and the military occupation, were the first American Jews to lay eyes upon the survivors as they made their exodus into the safety of the American zone of occupation. They were in the unique position of being the first eyes and the first ears for a world just beginning to understand the extent of the atrocities committed and for whom the words which we currently use, such as genocide, Shoah, and Holocaust, did not even exist in that era. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, I hope. Questions? Yes, of course, yes. Miss. Well, maybe stay um, I think your father was very admirable. Your, your father obviously was very interested in the welfare of the Jewish refugees after the war. But then you make a leap, and your leap is to the present situation of refugees. I think that there, even though you disagree, I think there is absolutely no comparison between the refugees today and the refugees then. All right, uh, to, to have been intentionally exterminated is not the same as enduring war conditions. And to, to say that they are the same uh, devalues the, uh, the horror of the, of the Jewish existence in concentration camps and what went on during World War II. I don't actually disagree with you. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, quite honestly, and, and you know, you spoke well. The Thank name of this organization is the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism. I, as a Jew, not having parents who survived the Holocaust, but having parents who suffered from anti-Semitism in Europe, 
uh, and tell me about how terribly they were treated and my father having survived a pogrom, etc. I, I feel very uh, obligated to pursue Jewish interests being secure in any country because my father always had said to me, Susan, you're very naive if you think that a Holocaust against Jews will never occur again. And you're naive to think that it won't even, that there's no possibility that it would happen in America. So therefore, my focus is, and I think every Jew's focus should be, on the preservation of Israel and of the Jewish people. I personally do not want my monies or my efforts directed toward taking care of the concern of the Syrians or anyone of that sort. There's a whole, so that's a Muslim problem that affects us, but I would like other Muslims to take care of their problems. I don't hear any moderate Muslims coming out and, and making negative statements about ISIS or Hezbollah, et cetera. They don't. Now, probably it's because of fear. But they are the ones who should be concerned about what is happening. With may the I interrupt? May we interrupt you for a second? If you give me your email, I will send you the beginning of that. I will send you the beginning of what I saw the other day, which were two very, very brave on two separate uh, newscasts standing up and standing up and actually saying, have you ever in modern times, or I'm putting the modern times in quotes, seen a Jew cut off somebody's head or hands? And they stood up and they, they spoke against it while their counterparts took the, the other side. So I think it's beginning. I agree totally. I think that the moderate Muslims should take a stand. So I don't actually disagree with you. It's not black and white. <coughs> Janet? <clears throat> yes, and um, I'd like to take an issue with some of your premises. And one is that in 1933, Lemkin first tried to get the Genocide Convention, although uh, passed, and it was Nazi Germany. There was a, sort of a convention of friendly countries, and they got together in Madrid, and he tried to get it passed, and it was Nazi Germany that stopped it. And so the the, his dedication to stopping the programs of the Jews was something that he felt should be put in place to protect the world. And secondly, this isn't about numerosity. I do think the Holocaust was unique. I think the degree of extermination, the degree of enmity to target one, and I've been studying it for 45 years. So I do agree it's unique, but what's unique also are our protections on genocide. That it, the Jews were numerous. I mean, they were one third of Baghdad. They were, you know, one fourth of Rangoon, Burma. But it doesn't matter. The Genocide Convention is to protect the values of the world. The values that we live in a world protecting unique religions and cultures, and the value of being tolerant and appreciate them. And so the Yazidis are not Muslims. They're not big like the Jews, but they're targeted for extermination. It's very explicit. If you look at the readings of the Islamic uh, kind of <clears throat> distorted writings of ISIS, it's much like what was said about the Jews in Mein Kampf. They're not people of the book. They're not Jews or Christians. Um, and what's happening to them, you know, if you want to preserve the values of the Genocide Convention, you don't say, well, that's just a few people. Because that's the mistake here. You could say Israel's just a small country. I mean, the idea is if we don't preserve the values for all people, you're not going to have pe the preservation for the next Holocaust of the Jews. You know, it has to, you have, people have to stand up. But you have to pay it forward. Say, and I would say that is a Jewish value. I Thank mean, the you. Jewish value is that that's why um, the Jews have given so much support to enforcing the Genocide Convention. 
I'm, I'm a lawyer, an international lawyer, so I believe that not to misuse um, the word genocide. I'm not sure that Bashir, when he did mass atrocities and defer, I don't, I'm not sure that was genocide. But I am sure that what's happening to these cities is genocide and that we have to treat it as such and that I just take issue with some of your overgeneralizations. Thank you. Okay. May I respond? That's up sure. To her. Please. <laughs> Dialogue um, is always please, welcome. You know, uh, every organization, it's a Jewish organization that I'm aware of, has always come out uh, speaking about uh, the need for uh, Jews to be uh, very uh, cognizant of and sensitive to uh, all of the um, discrimination that occurs throughout the world. Okay, I, and I, that is a Jewish value. I, but since you're, you are more familiar with worldwide organizations, would you please cite for me a Muslim organization or even a Christian organization or any other religious organization and 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 not a not not an organization of Christian fundamentalists because I know that they are our friends more than even some other some Jews. Uh, which which of those organizations would you tell me would could you please explain to me is as fervent in its uh, the, uh, concern about Israel and Jews as we are about other groups. Let's talk about the Holocaust. Well, so um, I'd like to mention briefly, so after you respond, please, just so not to take away what's going on here, so that we want to... Right, and I, but I just want no, to remind that during the Fahud, which was part of Nazi policies to exterminate the Jews in Iraq, it was Jewish Muslims who saved more Jews. Wait, wait, you said Jewish Muslims. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry. Iraqi Arab Jews. Muslims what? Iraqi? Saved Iraqi Jews during the Fahud, which was a Nazi Holocaust instigated crystal knock that killed, that killed far fewer Jews than did crystal knock because of the, the Muslim, uh, the Muslims stood up where the Germans didn't. And so that's a very good example of that you can't, um, you can't just generalize that we have to learn from history. And there was certainly more solidarity to oppose Hitler uh, and to support the Jews in Iraq than there was in Germany. Okay, but I'm talking about the present time because I do know that there were mo many Muslims uh, in many countries in Europe who uh, protected Jews against the Nazis. But in, pre in present day world conditions, Tell me of one group which well, comes out which is not Jewish. Oh, I understand. Strongly, other than fundamentalists, well, are the Jews I, being exterminated? No, I didn't I, know. I, think, I understand no, your question. Uh, Israel. Wait, excuse me. How about if we let Jill Harris speak? I, I understand your question, but I, I think the larger issue is that uh, there are two things in response to that. When you've got, as Nina had pointed out in her talk, when you've got um, Muslim governments and Muslim people not even supporting the Muslim and Syrian refugees, um, you might not find uh, obvious examples of them supporting Jewish causes as Jews do to Muslims, let's say. But I think the larger question that you have to ask yourself, or we have to ask ourselves as Jews is, what are our values and what do we seek and what are, what are our inherent, um, um, what's our moral code, notwithstanding what other people do? I mean, it's a very simple kind of teaching tolerance at a very low level to kindergartners, which is too long, don't look right. You know, you want to emulate, you want to be the kind of person that practices going along. You want to heal the world. And whether that's healing the world for Jews or others, that is what you said before. And you also mentioned that it's a, it's a Jewish value. So I don't think the question is, well, what have you done for us? So we're going to, then, and then we'll do for you. I think the question is, is what is the moral high ground and who do you want to be? So you might be very right, and maybe there can be education efforts or something to make more Muslims aware that they too can be supporting. You know, that, that's a, a minefield. But, you know, I think the essential issue is to ask yourself, who do you want to be as a Jewish person? I think the central issue is Jewish survival. 
Yes, I think so too, but what it's not mutually exclusive. Else? Yes, that but you can't exclusive? live in a vacuum and okay. you can't just That's build monuments I, to I the Holocaust. You, you must. It's a central value, but is it the only value? <clears throat> uh, well, I, I, worldwide, in, and, and I don't mean to be argumentative. No, not at all. I'm but worldwide, saying. there is a uh, huge uh, criticism of Israel. And undeservedly so. 100%. Okay? That's what I would like to correct. That is an issue that I would like to deal with. Okay? There are millions of people in the world, and they're not going to protect or be that concerned about Israel the way a Jew should be. And it just ends up that way. Yeah. I'm, still a, I'm still humane. I'm still decent. I treat my fellow citizen with consideration, but I feel that my major concern should be on Jewish survival, the survival of Israel, and of, and of other Jews. But that's an admirable and, and that's right. that's a wonderful thing, yeah. but we are all people in this room, and I have had an incredible experience doing an incredible amount of research for this book, and it's led me in, in to, to be more of a humanitarian in as much as I can, to tell our story and to never forget. So this is my way of doing it, which may not be your way of doing it, but it's not that I disagree with you. It's that it has taken me on an enormous path. I mean, my book is uh, traveling through the United Nations at the moment it is very, very well regarded. And why is it well regarded? It's re well regarded because my point of view is a global point of view. As the child of a refugee, as the child of a surviving refugee, I care very much about my fellow human being. Yes, of course, I do not want to see another genocide directed at the Jews. Of course, Israel should have a place in this world and should not be blown off the map. Of course, I, who could, what Jew could disagree with that? And there are issues, but that doesn't preclude me from caring about the rest of the world. So on that level, I firmly disagree with you. Anybody else? Thank you so well, much. I, I what you, have you have. Yeah. No, no, I knew Vivaldi was waiting no, for the so end. Like, no, well, on behalf of ISGAP, we want to thank you for a very sensitive and um, very instructive presentation. So I have about four or five questions you have to bear with me, okay? So, uh, and growing up, growing up, uh, you, you, you're spending time with your father and he has this inner world, this inner country. And so how would you describe your father's attitude about all living with this World War II as a subjective dimension of this person? And um, did you have any hunches about what the letters later, later revealed? I probably was the... Two questions for, for him. You're going to have to shorten your questions. Yeah, yeah. But no, they, okay, Vivaldi is, uh, Jean-Marie is asking whether I had any sense of uh, what my father went through um, when I was growing right. up. And I can clearly tell you that, that no. I either was extremely clueless, and he was very, very reserved, mm -hmm. um, and it was very hard to get past that reserve. There were maybe three clues, and after my father died, and while I was writing the book, people would call me and say, you know, your father spoke to me about the war. And I'd sit back on the phone, and I would laugh quietly and say, really? And what did he tell you? The same three tidbits. He never spoke about it at all. And so when he handed me this green box, I opened it up, I, I coughed because it was so dusty, and then I called my best friend and I mm -hmm. said, or we were walking down the street in fact, and I told her what he had given me and she said, that's your inheritance. And this was born out of this box, and I really didn't know anything. Okay. So, also, you, you mentioned that you he spent a great deal of time chronicling what happened in the war. So, so is it fair then to read the letters as sort of an instrument against revisionist history? 
which you read your project as being. Do you think that's something that your father started much earlier as an army personnel? Sort of the letters as sort of testimonies so to warn future <coughs> generations to never let that happen again. Breaking down the question, did I, did I chronicle uh, that I'm a that I chronicled my father's history and I'm a, that I've chronicled World War II extensively, and did my father actually think about that? I suppose on some level, some level that he did, he very clearly uh, had a focus, and that was to prevent more anti-Semitism. He was very, very upset by what he saw, understandably, mm -hmm. because, but by the grace of God, he, he could have been him. And so I suspect now, many years later, that my father knew exactly what he was doing, mm -hmm. because he always did. And uh, so I think yes. Mm. So Holocaust <coughs> education as Holocaust condemnation, could you sort of just elaborate? Well, I feel... I think it's a wonderful, thank you. very rich concept. Mm -hmm. The question about speaking about the Holocaust as a form of condemnation. Well, I think that the minute one speaks up about an issue and about anti-Semitism and about the history of something, that that's a form of condemnation. And these letters, actually, to answer the previous question uh, in a more <coughs> detailed way, my father sent home a happy Rosh Hashanah letter on Nazi letterhead, which I think is the really a form of um, you know, of condemnation of uh, of rebellion, and so the more you speak about something, the louder you speak about it, and to the more people you speak about it, it becomes a reality. I mean, I just as I said this morning, just underneath the comments of Beethoven Seventh, somebody is denying the Holocaust, and there it is. And, and I mean, I think Hitler's in the audience, so. Uh, I, I firmly believe that you know each of these letters, even one of these letters on a Nazi letterhead, and it wasn't even very br bright, it was white on white, I was able to identify the Nazi to whom it belonged. Mm -hmm. And so how can one be a Holocaust denier when you're faced with this? You know, when you're faced with some of the propaganda and it's right in front of you and you have not only the child, the grandson, and the man who wrote these letters, and you see it, it's real. I have one final question. <laughs> I don't want to dive into the conversation. So, I w so I'd like to sort of revisit the anecdote. Jacob yells, hey, mommy, I'm doing my homework, and I feel like granddad is in the room with me. Sort of, is it fair then to read this moment, and then in connection with the letters, the 700 letters, as sort of encapsulating this, the inner life of your dad that he never talked about much because sort of as the letter is being read he says he feels his granddad's presence so, and when you were writing the book you going through those letters did you have the sense that those words and the way that they were organized the series the chronicles they encapsulate and embody your your father's inner life that he didn't talk much about when you were growing up the question is, you know, when Jacob was in his room as an eight-year-old laughing when he should have, as he was doing his homework, did my father's personality come out in that inner life? Well, I, I would say to a great degree we got to see not only, you know, the, the plight of this adult, very adolescent argumentative young man, as well as how he felt, what he mm -hmm. felt, in some ways, but you could see it. He was a boy who wanted to go home, like any of us. He was a refugee who, was, who ran away and had to, didn't know if he'd ever live to see that house again. It's all he wanted in the world was to, to go home, like any of us would. And so I think that his personality did come out. I mean, I listened to every piece of music he listened to. I pulled up clips from every movie that he mentioned. I pulled up the weather. I pulled up every single detail. Jacob could probably tell you this ad nauseum with music playing and juxtaposing things together until I brought about a portrait, for lack of a way, better mm -hmm. way to do this, but a portrait of a young man mm -hmm. um, before, during, and after the war who grew into my father. 
I want to thank ISGAP and I want to thank Charles Asher Small in absentia and uh, Ira Guberman and uh, Vivaldi Jean Marie and well, everybody who Thanks. came today. Thank you so very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you.